Hello and welcome to Supercat's final live demonstration of the day. This is our final demonstration. It's brought to you by me, Nikki Yeoman, your host. And I'm also joined by my crew today who will be taking questions at the end of the show. Now this is the last one and it's about our electric all-terrain mobility platform and our OptiMan variant, which I'm sure you can't wait to find out about. Now, if you want to ask any questions, there will be a comments box, but please, they're on the link on the program. You have to click through and it will open up into the YouTube channel where the comments box is. Now, you might be wondering why we've brought you live demonstrations today. Well, exhibitions have been cancelled all over the world because of coronavirus. But we don't want to let that stop us bringing you the latest technology innovations that our engineering team have been working tirelessly through the night to bring to you. Now, please get involved ask those questions. Also, please use Twitter at Supercat Limited and use the hashtag Supercat Live. If you are watching this on Catch Up or you have a commercial sensitive question, you must please go to info-uk at supercat.com. That's info-uk at supercat.com. Please email us at that address. Now, that's all that's left for me to say is sit back and relax and enjoy the show. Now over to you, Matt and Yash. David Clayton and Nick Jones developed the Mark 180 MP primarily for agricultural use. However, after the Falklands War, the UK MOD found a capability gap for a low ground pressure all-terrain vehicle to carry large payloads. They took around 200 ATMPs uh, with a further 50 going to the Malaysians and a one further vehicle for the MAST team uh, conducting autonomous research. The ATMP was used effectively in the recovery of containers of combat supplies on the drop zones and moving them to the safety of the tree lines before supporting the brigade during their advances to battle. The utility of being air transportable, amphibious, it would carry huge payloads and have an extremely low ground pressure made it a soldier's favourite and it's now hugely missed. The opportunity that the EATMP gives is the same outstanding performances with the leap forward in technology. And here we are at the present day. This is the EATMP. Uh, back in 2017, Supercat formed a knowledge transfer partnership with the University of Exeter with the aim of electrifying the ATMP. I was fortunate enough to be the prime candidate for the KTP, joining the Supercat team. The KTP aims to transfer knowledge and allow universities to get their research into companies and into the, therefore products that are out in the market. Our KTP programme was geared towards using the ATMP as a testbed for further new technologies, with the first programme of design and development was to convert the vehicle from diesel power to electric, which successfully concluded in 2019, where we received a prestigious outstanding grading from the expert panel. We've replaced its traditional diesel engine with six electric motors, with one attached to each wheel, and this can be configured for full electric or hybrid variants. The EATMP retains a lot of the excellent features that the standard ATMP had, including the 45 degree approach and departure angle, the large low ground pressure tyres, allowing it to have the ground pressure less than that of a human footprint. It also enables one-handed operation using the foot thro uh, hand throttle. There's also a foot throttle as well. Uh, uses the original vehicle. You may remember that the vehicle had skid steering. This was operated hydraulically. Uh, Nowadays, we can use the electric motors to lock on the inside using this thumb control. Uh, the vehicle also retains the Ackerman steering, allowing the front to steer more than the centre. This keeps it stable on road and allows it to travel up to speeds of 40 miles an hour. It also retains the large load bed that allows it to carry a standard NATO pallet. As well as this, it can be underslung from uh, various helicopters, uh, as well as being stacked one on top of another and loaded into the back of several different aircraft. Here's a video of me at the test track taking this out for a spin.
The ATMP is the world's most popular, versatile off-road vehicle of its type. So the new technology in the EATMP opens up the market for emergency services, rail, marine, forestry and aerospace. This electric drivetrain can be customised depending on the range, payload and operating environment. Crucially, when applied to other off-highway transportation, the electric drivetrain can be tailored and customised depending on the mission, range, payload and operating environment that each vehicle will be used for. It's a suitable vehicle for field hospitals or communication systems and because the electric vehicles emit little heat or noise, the vehicle can be stealthy on the battlefield. Now the innovative eco-friendly vehicle has been developed further so it can be optionally manned. I'll now hand over to Yash who is the lead engineer of the autonomous and optionally manned project. Thank you so much Mark for explaining my role. I was designated as the main uh, KTP lead for autonomy section where we use the knowledge taught in academia and correlate with that in the industry. There have been research going on across autonomous sections so here I would I'm going to be explaining you with the motion control of the vehicle. The first thing is the how we control the drive. It's a six configuration of motor controllers over there which is connected to the master controller. The master controller is deployed with robotics algorithms that use dynam dynamic and kinematic models. From over here, we use the control area network to define different commands through the systems. We use the master controller to switch between man and man functions with the flick of a switch. Starting on that, we move towards the sensors. A sensor suit is using vision sensors of cameras which are displayed over, up on the top, over here, and at the back. We have got a LiDAR that uses the point cloud technology to make a 3D map of the surroundings. This forms the environment mapping section. Looking into the classification, we use neural networks. So for neural networks, we thought of using a GPU because we are getting a lot of microprocessor power. We need to designate this task to GPU. Over here is a master controller for the autonomous operations. It's an NVIDIA unit that uses Linux kernel based inside it. We use different algorithms, which slowly amplifies the whole system around. Using these specific algorithms, we have converted convolutional neural networks to understand what classification we can give for the train. So when the main motion control commands are going in, we have another, con uh, another CAN network data that flows through the network. Coming back over here, the LiDAR and all these sensors are located with the inertial measurement unit. So, changing the position of the sensor would change the quantum radian. That forms exactly the sensor fusion we require for the systems. Back over here, we have a location module. We have specifically put the location modules at the center of the vehicle to designate the main uh, function of IMU. We also have the IMUs on the front and at the back of the master controller designated. This forms a complete simultaneous localization and mapping. Using these algorithms, we have put up different matrices that perform on the GPU. Coming back to the section of using the resources available on the vehicle completely, we have gone down to the level of using proper GPU kernels and using CUDA, CUDA kernels to define how we are working through the mathematical algorithms. In this total, we have different functions. So looking on these systems, the vehicle can perform waypoint navigation, it can go for a collision avoidance systems, it can shift between unmanned control, and they, they, all these operations are programmable on a PixHawk. PixHawk unit is in sight over here, which provides amplified units for localization sensors. Looking at the motion control aspect of the vehicle, we have got a six motor control configuration that is commanded by a master controller at the back. In this motion control equations, we have put up robotic algorithms which support the dynamic. It also uses the vehicle's coefficient of friction. We have different dimensions on the vehicle that can be included in the configuration. This defines the main, control, uh, main motion control body, which is connected via control area network. Now, this defining on this main control section, we have an AI computer over here. G going back to the sensors, we have a suit of vision sensors, which is in the front, a 3D sensor over here, at the top and at the back of the vehicle. That is integrated with the LiDAR with the point cloud algorithm. To process this, we need additional power for a GPU. So the NVIDIA units provide us with that. We have additional units also for dividing the resource and using them quite efficiently. Looking into the back of the environment mapping section, we use convolution neural networks to classify objects around. Classifying objects define how the vehicle drives in the motion area and what kind of obstacles are there. These decisions are checked with a confidence map. So look, coming back over here on the master controller and the front camera, it's, this camera is a 3D point cloud camera. This, all these sensors are fused together using the sensor fusion algorithm that confines using a Kalman filters. 
All this brought up together, it forms a simultaneous localization and mapping of the vehicle. This will be live happening on the vehicle and we'll have data that we can be receiving on back. All these functionalities will help in unmanned platforms. For example, uh, we're using motion control, uh, we're using mapping algorithms, we are using other motion control work that finally defines the path for using a waypoint navigation, collision avoidance, classification. So all of this works together. You may ask why we are investing heavily into electrification. We see that the UK seeks to gain a performance advantage and we have the engineering capabilities to be at the forefront of the electric revolution in the defence and off-road market. Let's see the EATMP in action. At Supercat, we pride ourselves on our continuous development and investment in leading class military defence vehicles. In line with MOD's Science and Technology Strategy 2020, set out by Defence Secretary Ben Wallace, where there is an imminent need to strengthen our technologies to overcome emerging new threats, Supercat will be leading the way. The EATMP electric drivetrain and now the optionally manned and autonomous capability programmes are delivering on the current and future market trends. Now back to Nikki in the studio, who will be taking your questions. Hello and welcome back to the studio. Thank you Matt and Yash so much for explaining to us about the electric ATMP and the optionally manned variant. Now I'd like to invite Matt to the stage. How are you Matt? Hey, How are you? Very well, thank you. Good, good, good. Good to see you. Thank you so much for talking right. us through that. Um, we've had some great questions come in. Um, one question, has this been driven on the Falklands? I'm not entirely sure it has been driven on the Falklands. It was inspired by the Falklands War where they needed a low ground pressure, high mobility, uh, load carrying vehicle. And so they replicated this by testing the vehicle in the Isle of Jura. Um, wow. It was then used in both Gulf Wars and obviously the Malaysians use it. So it's very sort of similar terrain really. Okay, well that's interesting. Thank you very much. Another question has come through. Um, why did you choose to have individual wheel drive? Can you explain that? Yeah, so it gave us the flexibility to have, to be able to sort of control each wheel individually. And um, we felt that this gave a bit of a sort of energy usage advantage because each wheel only needs to kind of work as hard as it can. Um, the flexibility with electric drivetrain allows you to sort of, whereas you're quite fixed with an engine and gearbox, having electric motors, you can put them as you want. So mm -hmm. depending on the usage profile, we could change it to suit really. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Um, also, uh, what power unit options are there for the vehicle? Um, quite a lot, anything that can provide a DC voltage really. Um, with the original vehicle, it had a, uh, the obviously diesel and gearbox and transaxle, uh, diesel engine and transaxle gearbox. Mm -hmm. And when we remove this, it's quite a large space for anything really. So currently we've got a large battery pack in the vehicle you can see behind us. Uh, but this could be removed and the chemistries can be different. Um, if it's uh, short range, it could mm -hmm. be lead acid. If it's longer range, it could go to lithium ion. Uh, we can also put hybrid en an engine in, make it a hybrid, and that can charge the batteries and pro propel the vehicle as well. But I think the options, it, we tried to keep the main sort of features of the vehicle and move into the electric drive has allowed us to do this, really. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, also, is the vehicle still amphibious with the new drivetrain? Yeah, so we've tried to keep the sort of good qualities of the original vehicle and all components that are inside are IP rated. And um, it's not something we've tested yet, but we're still early on in the testing phase. So it's definitely something that we'll, we'll look at and try. Okay, excellent. And I think I've got one final question here for you, Matt. Um, do you still feel the vehicle in general is still relevant on the battlefield today? Yeah, I feel so. I think with the advancements, as far as we're aware, it's the only vehicle of its sort of type that can be 
that has the sort of payload capability, has conventional steering and can travel at speeds up to 40 mm -hmm. miles an hour. And so with the optionally manned option as well, it just allows it to be used for the sort of dull, dirty and dangerous tasks <laughs> and get the operator into a sort of safer environment really. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much, Matt. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions now for Steve. If I could invite Steve up. Hi, Nikki. Hi, Steve. You all right? Yeah, very well. You? Good. Yeah, not too bad. Thank you. Right. I've got a question that's come in that says, how suitable is the current concept for boat launch and recovery applications? That's a great question, Nikki. Well, um, the ATMP has previously been used for recovery operations, say in the in the Humber Estuary, um, and also has been trialled by the RNLI previously um, for launch and recovery. And it's also currently in use in the Royal Navy for uh, launch recovery of UUVs. So we think it's, it's pretty well suited. Um, the vehicle has been set up so it can uh, have a, a waterproof electric uh, winch mounted at either end of the vehicle. Um, and also, yeah, it's, it's um, the main components in there are ruggedized and waterproof, ready for operation near, uh, near the sea. Oh, wow. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, thank you. Um, and also, another question for you, Steve. Has the EATMP got a tracked option and would it be retrofitted to the current model or be a new model? Okay, so it would be the same model. Yeah. Um, the previous iterations of the e of the ATMP have been fitted uh, and supplied with tracks. Uh, we haven't yet tried it with the EAMTE ATMP, but we are sure it wouldn't be an issue to, to, to sort of make sure that was a case. So yeah, it's something we should try, uh, no problems whatsoever. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you ever so much. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to call Yash up to the sure, stage. Thanks, Thank Dave. You. Appreciate it. Hi, Yash, all right? Thank you so much, Nikki. Yeah, no, thank you. no, thank you. Thank you for that um, walkthrough as well on the optionally manned variant. That was great. Um, I've got a couple of questions here that have come in. Um, one question is, uh, what TRL is the EATMP or optionally manned ATMP at? So uh, currently we are sitting at conservatively basically uh, saying that we'll be at TRL level 5, but there's progress going towards TR level 6. We have a lot of tests that we have planned, which is going to be features building from waypoint navigation to object uh, avoidance systems, collision avoidance systems, and slowly getting to base point return systems. So that will bring it up more. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I've got one final question, which is what's next for optionally manning or autonomy at Supercat? Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. So, uh, but what we have learned on the optionally manned platform is how we can board this technology now, the HMT. The thing is, we have to test on major uh, sensor configurations mm -hmm. so that we collect appropriate data throughout it and then put all the optionally manned technology transferred to the HMT and uh, go on for testing of much more data collection and neural networks and slowly defining how the drive can work around. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Well, that's all we've got time for. So I'd like to say thank you to both Matt, Yash and Steve for their time answering those questions today. I'd also like to say a huge thank you to the crew and all the Supercat team who have made this possible under the tight COVID restrictions. Also, just to let you know that all our videos from today will be available on our website in the next couple of days, which is supercat.com. Also, if you have any additional questions post any of our events today, please do email info-uk at supercat.com. And all that's left for me to say is take care and be safe. Thank you so much for watching.